Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the Fathers of the Church, Christian Antiquity, the Patristic Period. We left off last time with the death of Pope Sixtus I uh, on, um, in uh, in 130, uh, excuse me, in uh, 125, 125 AD, he was followed as eighth pope by Saint Telesphorus, T E L E S P H O R U S who uh, reigned from June 6th, 125, until his death on, well, uh, January 2nd, 136. St. Telesphorus was ethnically Greek, born in southern Italy, in a, a village, uh, uh, what was uh, Terra Nova di Sabari, in uh, Calabria, that's that's extreme southern Italy. It was on a, a hill. The village was on a hill between the river Crati and the Sila Mountains, uh, located about twelve miles from the sea. This area was part of the ancient Magna Graecia, uh, Magna Graecia, the, the Greater Greece, which we covered in the beginning of the course. As part of the uh, the Greek uh, periods, uh, the three periods of Greek colonization, establishing maritime colonies in uh, Sicily, southern Italy, as well as many other places. The other circumstances of his birth and family are not known. However, at some point prior to becoming Pope, he traveled to the Holy Land and lived in the Holy Land as a hermit on Mount Carmel. And for that reason, he is venerated by the Carmelites as one of their ancient uh, patrons, one of their ancient progenitors, so to speak. Uh, St. Irenaeus, in Against the Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3, line 3, wrote that uh, Sixtus was appointed after him to Lasphorus, who was gloriously martyred, but doesn't tell us how. As Pope, uh, Telesphorus set apart a fast of seven weeks. It should be kept prior to Easter. Now, uh, so what does a fast mean? Well, earlier when we covered the Didache, we, we found that in the Didache, chapter 8, line 1, that it recommended fasting for Christians on Wednesdays and Fridays. Wednesday, because that's the day of the week that Judas made his deal to betray Jesus. And Friday, of course, because that's the day that, that, that we, that humans, murdered Jesus. Uh, Telesphorus is the first pope credited in the Liber Pontificalis, the Book of Popes, with instituting a five-year, excuse me, a multi-week fast as a preparation for Easter. Though, like the Didache, he did not define exactly what a fast meant, so that would leave us with the instructions of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount, where it says, uh, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. So in other words, it, it doesn't matter if anyone even knows that you're fasting. At least it doesn't matter if other people know, uh, as long as God knows. And of course, you know, if you are fasting, then God knows. And uh, fasting as a, as a penance is discussed in the Catechism number 1434. Telesphorus is also credited with appointing that the season of the Nativity of our Lord, uh, that uh, Masses should be celebrated 
uh, during the night. Um, and added that the Gloria, although the, the language used, the liturgical language at the time, like the New Testament language, was Greek. So uh, it, it was the, the, the doxa, the doxology, the greater doxology. Gloria is a Latin word, so doxa is just the Greek word for glory. Uh, Telesphorus is credited with adding the Gloria to the Mass of the Nativity, so the be like Midnight Mass. At this period, uh, of course, the, the text was in Greek. It would later be translated into Latin by St. Hilary of Poitiers in the 4th century. He is the was he was the first Latin doctor of the church. St. Athanasius is the first doctor of the church, but he was Greek. The Gloria, or the greater doxology, begins, of course, since Catholicism is biblically based, it's a, it's a biblical, it's based on the Bible, uh, starts with the, the words of the angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, announcing the birth of the Lord. Hence, its original context as part of the Mass of the Nativity. When, uh, when the uh, now catching up with Roman history, uh, when the Emperor Trajan died of a stroke, as we, we covered that last time, he was succeeded as princeps et imperator by his. Uh, uh, adopted heir Publius Ilius Adrianus, or better known as the Emperor Hadrian. This is Emperor number 14. Hadrian was born in Italica, well, the same place Trajan was born, in the Italica near modern Seville, Spain. At the time, it was the Roman province of Hispania Baetica, Remember, we, we covered that the that the Iber the Romans had divided the Iberian Peninsula into four provinces, and this was one of them. Hadrian was born there on the twenty fourth of January, seventy six A.D. His father Publius Ilius Adrianus Afer was a senator of Praetorian rank, born in the in Italica, but descended from an ancient family of, of Picenum in Italy. The family ancestor who relocated them to Hispania did so after serving in the army of the illustrious Scipio Africanus, the man who defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic War. More recently, oh, and that's... Uh, the the, uh, the Car Hannibal fought for the Carthaginians, and the Carthaginians had colonized Spain. So when Scipio Africanus defeated the Carthaginians, then the Romans stole Spain and, and colonized Spain. So that's so uh, Hadrian's ancestor had fought in the armies of Scipio Africanus, which which won the Second Punic War, and then uh, you know the the standard imperial procedure was exterminate the men and then settle the legions there to intermarry with the women so that's that's what happened Hadrian's mother was Domitia Paulina she was born in uh, Cadiz uh, on the Roman maps today that's Cadiz Spain and uh, she was from another distinguished Hispano-Roman family senatorial rank Hadrian had only one sibling an older sister named Ilia Domitia Paulina, named for her mother. In 86 AD, when Hadrian was age 10, both of his parents died. Now, now we are told the cause, but since they weren't, since Spain was not invaded at that point uh, and was at peace, and they both died at the same time, that suggests an, an illness. Uh, but whatever the case, they, Hadrian and his sister were orphaned. So, uh, as we covered in the reign of Trajan, Hadrian and his sister became wards of Trajan and, uh, and one of Trajan's army buddies, uh, who, uh, Publius Acilius Attianus, who later 
when Trajan became emperor, Trajan made him prefect of the Praetorian Guard. Trajan ensured that Hadrian received the education appropriate to an aristocrat, uh, which Hadrian avidly absorbed. He, he was a naturally he was very intelligent. He, he, he was one that, that loved to learn. Also physically active. He did, he did like hunting and all, but he was also, you know, he wasn't just that. He did, he did enjoy learning. In particular, uh, he, he, he enjoyed the, the arts, uh, literature, uh, poetry, and uh, architecture, but above all, uh, all things Greek, uh, the Greek language, Greek culture. His Hellenophilia, his love of all things Greek, was so pronounced that that his, uh, well, we I guess we'd say his classmates today, although school wasn't exactly, well, actually was nothing like it is today, but his age cohort, they're the, they're the guys in his age cohort, uh, nicknamed him uh, uh, Graculus. Which, which means the the little Greek or or the uh, the Greekling, the the Greekling, because he loved it so much, but he didn't care. Is he, he he? It was lifelong. Um, it was uh, it was not long. Uh, being Trajan being his guardian, and of course you know Trajan was a uh, was a soldier by not only because that's just what men of his class did, but he Trajan was one who just really loved soldiering. Uh, so with this guy's guardian, it was, it was Hadrian, of course, was sent into the army. In 95 AD, he served as tri, uh, uh, Tribuni uh, Militium, which was a military tribune. Now, I should say, the, uh, the Romans, the Roman army, like our army, well, like all armies, of course, it's it's a hierarchical structure, and they had an officer corps, and uh, they had non commissioned officers and and commissioned. Although that distinction was not exactly the same as today, uh, the the term most familiar from the legions would be the uh, the centurion, because we meet a, a couple of centurions in the in the New Testament. Now, uh, even though the 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 word centurion, uh, it's derived from the the Latin word for hundred, so it suggests, an, you know, a, a, a soldier who commanded a hundred men. And while that is true, however, they there were actually ten levels uh, of centurion, so it was uh, it was indexed. Uh, now the tribune was a level above that. Uh, the tribune is, well, there the were military tribunes and civilian tribunes. So the military tribune uh, in each legion uh, had, uh, uh, let's see, each, well, at this period, they had six. Yeah, six military tribunes. So one for each thousand in the in the uh, in the legion so the a legion at this period was 5000 fighting men plus 1000 support logistics and so the uh, the six tribunes they would be in charge of 1000 men and they'd each have 10 centurions under them uh okay anyway so hadrian served as one of those uh, i suppose let's see today that would 1000 men i guess that would correspond to a major yeah, more than a captain. I suppose a thousand men in our army would correspond to a regiment. So I guess it's a a major. Anyway, so that's that's what he was doing. He he was assigned. He served in the second legion, then in the same position in the fifth legion, then in the same position in the twenty second legion. Until one hundred one A.D., uh, he then with this you know military record. Uh, he then followed the the cursus honorum, went back home, following the you know the civilian uh, course of service of the the ladder of honor. Uh, he was elected as quaestor, and we talked about this earlier, so I, I won't repeat all that. He just he was elected quaestor to begin his ascent up the civilian cursus honorum. Why? So for this purpose, he had to be back in Rome, and the Romans had term limits. So for each of these civil these civilian magistracies, uh, 
that they only it was only a one year term, and you could not run for reelection in that office until ten years had passed, and very few would do that. Certainly not for the lower level ones, uh, but they they would serve, and they so then they would they would rise, um, and then after. I mean, Hadrian was in a, a privileged position, of course, because of because of Trajan. But uh, even others of the senatorial class, they would they would serve in the army. Then they would rise up the cursus honorum. Now, it would not generally just be one year after another, uh, especially after the later ones. So, like like after serving a year as a praetor, then you were eligible to get a, a be appointed a, a governor somewhere. So that's a five year appointment. You'd be a pro praetor. And the same with consul, You'd serve a year as consul, and then you were eligible to be a proconsul, a five-year term as a governor somewhere. So uh, anyway, but he starts as quaestor. So he had to be, stay in Rome at least a year. And, and while he was there, Trajan's wife, Plotina, uh, arranged a marriage for Hadrian to Trajan's 18-year-old niece, Vibia, Vibia Sabina. Uh, then uh, Trajan, once he became emperor, of course, we covered all the, the wars. Uh, so even though, like if, under previous emperors who were not as involved in expansion, after the military service Hadrian did, after being elected quaestor, he probably would have been finished with the army. But Trajan mobilized for expansion. So during the Dacian Wars, uh, Hadrian went back into the army. But Trajan did not want to completely... Uh, divert his civilian career, so he did grant him leave to return to Rome in 105 in order to be elected for a term as a, a civilian as, a, as a, 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 a civilian tribune of the plebeians, uh, which, which was which was another civilian office, one term in office. but it was a, a but they did sit in the Senate. There were 10, 10, 10, 10 civilian tribunes were elected every year. Uh, so he got to serve as one of them in 105. And after that, he went back uh, went back to the army. Uh, let's see what this is. Do that later. And he got a promotion. So he went back to fight in, in Dacia, uh, and he got a promotion as legate. Now, uh, uh, a legatus, it, it, even though it, it doesn't immediately look at, but if you look, you know, it, think about it, it does. It's derived from the word for legion, legion legatus. So uh, a legatus was the commander of a legion, it was a general, a general officer would be the, the commander of a single legion. And uh, so Hadrian got command of the, uh, of the first legion, uh, Legia I, Minerva. In 107, Trajan made Hadrian governor of Lower Pannonia. So he, uh, the, the, it was the, the rector provinciae of uh, Lower Pannonia, which was a Danube River province. That was an important appointment. I mean, it wasn't a, one of the famous provinces, not as well, you know, like Gaul or, or, or Britannia or Hispania, but it was strategically, it was a significant appointment, especially because they, they, you know, it was a war going on at that end of the empire. Uh, he served as praetor. Um, uh, so he, anyway, he served as tribune of the plebs in 105, then went back to the army, then went back to Rome, was elected praetor, uh, and then the following year in 107 was made pro praetorian governor of Lower Pannonia. Then in 108, he returned to Rome where he was elected for a term as consul. During the Quitos War, which we covered previously, that's the Second Jewish War, from 115 to 116. Uh, Trajan appointed Hadrian proconsular governor of Syria. And Hadrian was in that position when on uh, August 11th, 117, he, he received a messenger informing him that Trajan had died three days earlier on August 8th. So Hadrian followed as uh, as princeps at imperator. 
Hadrian is uh, best known uh, as in history. I mean, as a, as a builder, as a compulsive builder. He was a patron of the arts. He was a tireless traveler. He thought of himself as a as an enlightened intellectual. And he certainly was an intellectual. No, enlightened, well, that's... Uh, Hadrian, uh, he built walls, fortifications to protect the province. Uh, one of famous example is Hadrian's Wall in England, uh, which is still there. He built villas, aqueducts, roads, fortresses. He built a tomb for, <laughs> for himself, which was so huge that it was, that it was later used as a, as a papal palace. The Castle of San Angelo. It's still there. It's within, within walking distance of St. Peter's. It's a museum now. More than anything, in the, in the deepest core of his being, Hadrian was a Hellenophile, a lover of all things Greek. And even though Greece had been absorbed as a province of the Roman Empire for over 300 years, Hadrian still longed to be accepted by Greek intellectuals as one of their own. To this end, in 125 AD, Hadrian visited Athens, the, the cradle of Greek culture, which we also visited earlier in the course. Of course, he built things when he was there, because that's just what he did. Uh, he, he built a, a, a gymnasium for them and a library, uh, which was large enough that it, re, it, it required 120 columns to support the roof. The roof was gilded. He built a temple to Hera, the goddess Hera. He built another temple to the god Zeus Panhellenikos. And he provided them with a the state-of-the-art Roman aqueduct. Naturally, the locals showered him with praise. Uh, they, they had competitions. They produced works of art. They had public performances of of plays, they had competitions, with, you know, poetry reading, and uh, other performances in the theater. Which is, I mean, they, 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 I mean, they knew what, that's what he wanted, so that's what they did. But Hadrian wanted something, something more, more, something more visible and definitive to bind him to the to the lost, to the past, Periclean age. So, in a step that would cause much harm to Christianity. By, by giving imperial su support to Gnostic-type religions or the, Gnost or, or the pagan version of Gnosticism, the Emperor Hadrian joined the Eleusinian Mysteries. So Eleusis was a place spelled E-L-E-U-S-I-S, -E 15 miles northwest of Athens. So Eleusinian, E L. E U S I N I A N. <clears throat> it's uh, Eleusis. So Eleusis was a suburb, basically, of, of, of Athens. It's uh, it existed as a as a site for religious tourism, as we'd say today. I mean, maybe they would have thought of it as a pilgrimage, but I, I just I, I can't think of. You know, going to a pagan shrine as a pilgrimage, but that's that's just me. Anyway, Eleusis existed. Uh, it was the it, it was the the religious cult center of the Eleusinian mysteries. Now, the word the mysteries that that comes from the uh, the the Greek word mustes, m u s t e s, as transliterated into English, which means an initiate, because only one initiated into the cult could know its secrets, could have that knowledge. So you see, that's it's a Gnostic type, a Gnostic version of paganism. These uh, secrets revolved around the Greek myth explaining the seasons of the year. It was believed that Persephone, who was the, the daughter of the earth mother goddess Demeter, was abducted by the evil god of the underworld, Hades. And uh, wild with grief, mom, uh, Demeter, uh, scoured the earth looking for her daughter. And, and that was disrupting the natural order of things because she was the goddess of the earth, so things weren't growing because she was, she was distracted. 
So uh, the sun god, uh, Helios, told her what happened. He clued her in that, that her, her beautiful daughter was kidnapped by the, by the dark Hades, the evil, shadowy god Hades. Uh, and uh, Demeter was in Eleusis at the time when the sun, sun god, Helios, uh, clued her in to what was going on. Upon hearing the news that her daughter was in the underworld, a, a prisoner, captive, you know, that then, then she collapsed with grief and refused to move. And that had, that had consequences because she was the, the, she was the goddess of the earth. So the earth lost its fertility. Crops would not grow, animals would not mate, uh, and life almost ended. So Zeus, up on Mount Olympus, he, he, had to, he had to become involved. He salvaged the situation by uh, forging a, a bargain between his brother Hades and Demeter, in which Persephone would spend part of the year in the underworld with Hades, and the other part of the year on the surface of the earth with mom. So uh, that's how they explain the seasons of the year. So the, the winter is when, when, is when mom is grieving because her daughter is in the underworld. And then the spring and the summer is, you know, when she's happy. So the earth is, you know, is more pleasant to live in in the spring and the summer because the goddess of the earth is happy. Because her daughter's with her. So Eleusis existed as a place in which these events were reenacted in a series of secret cultic practices collectively known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. And it happened throughout the year because obviously the seasons of the year, you know, that go on all year. The mysteries included hierogamic rituals, and that is the, uh, it's a form of hieroduleia. Remember, Hierodule is the temple prostitution, but hierogamic, uh, that's, that's a, 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 it is that, but it's a particular version in which the initiates uh, and, the, and the priests and priestesses in, 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 the, in the mysteries, they would costume themselves as the different characters involved and then engage in the Hierodulia, in the, in the, uh, the ritual copulation and reenacting of the of the abduction which is which is called in literature the rape of persephone so i mean you know you, you get you get the you know you get in the picture here what what this was about and they they go through the whole thing the search you know the 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 rape of persephone and then she's missing then her mother gets hysterical searching the world the dying of the world so they could, they they would do all this all year so th this is one of many examples of paganism furthering the, the agenda of demonic powers because Satan benefits from few things more than from religiously approved and religiously promoted immorality. It's the ultimate perversion. And we know this. The Bible has you know, revealed this to us in many places. A few examples. Uh, Book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 21. You shall not offer any of your offspring for immolation to Molech. That's a condemnation of one version of human sacrifice. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verses 16 and 17. With strange gods, they incited, yeah, well, uh, the, the one God, the true God. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons not to gods, meaning that's the Mosaic interpretation of these pagan deities is that, uh, that they did exist, but not as deities, that they were actually demons. Whereas the other interpretation is that it was just all made up, that it's, it's just a complete fiction. Second book of Kings, chapter 21, verse 6, the 14th king of Judah, King Manasseh, um, sacrificed his child. I mean, in a human sacrifice, he immolated, you know, through fire. That's a sacrifice using, had his child incinerated. <clears throat> and he practiced uh, soothsaying and divination and uh, uh, necromancy, the uh, uh, magic using uh, 
dead bodies and, uh, and attempted to access the spirits of the dead. Uh, the Catechism summarizes the church teaching on the demonic in Numbers 391 through 395. And then uh, on superstition, idolatry, magic, divination in Numbers 2110 through 2117. You can refresh your memories there. So with that in mind, the Eleusinian mysteries were part of the pagan the ambient pagan belief in secret cultic magic and thergy and arcane knowledge reserved for only a select few and that represented a foundational principle of Gnosticism. Since Christian Gnostics were dualists who believed that anything done with the material body in the material world was inconsequential because it's, it's, all, it's, it's all scum anyway, a Christian Gnostic would have no hesitation and need feel no hesitation in joining the Eleusinian Mysteries. This act would free the Christian Gnostic from any suspicion of maestas, you know, of, of, uh, of, of treason, of, of being unwilling to participate in the, in the more important imperial cult. And as we've seen, this is a very, a very uh, useful recruiting tool for the, for the different versions of Gnosticism, which is why it lasted so long. During the reign of uh, Pope Telesphorus, uh, Basilides, uh, we met him before. He was a Gnostic. We covered uh, in the reign of Pope Sixtus. He, he moved to Alex, from Antioch to Alexandria. He founded a Gnostic cult school in Alexandria. He had a son named Isidore. So by the reign of Telesphorus, Isidore was... Had, was grown up and he was old enough to cause trouble on his own. So he uh, he wrote a book titled the the uh, the ethics ethics, in which Isidore the Gnostic argued that the elect uh, those are the ones who were uh, made uh, who, who were uh, uh, given access to the to the gnosis to the secret knowledge that they would be saved regardless of any anything that appeared to be sinful done during earthly life, such as participating in a pagan fertility cult prostitution. Because their election by possession of this secret knowledge made it impossible for their soul to go any place other than heaven once once they escaped, once it escaped from the prison of the material body. So St. Clement of Alexandria, who lived in the same city a generation later, commented on this work. He wrote, quote, uh, they, as the Gnostics, it's, it's, it's in a part of a larger section, so it's obvious he's talking about the Gnostics. Uh, they ought not, therefore, to take as a covering cloak the name of Christ, and by living lewder lives than the most uncontrolled heathens bring blasphemy upon his name. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, as far as the words whose end shall be like their works. Uh, that's from his uh, work, The Stromata, Book 3, Section 3. <clears throat> Isidore the Gnostic also wrote Another work titled The Explanation of the Prophet Parkour. It's P A R C H O R. And it has nothing to do with, with climbing buildings or, or jumping over obstacles in an urban landscape. I only mention that because seminarians in previous years, if they would always laugh when I, when I said that. And I said, what, What's so funny about parkour? I said, Well, okay. I don't know. But it's just it's it's a it's a false cognate. It's it's not the same thing. Uh, and he claimed in this in this book the explanation that the achievements of classical Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, were only possible because Socrates and Plato were actually Gnostics. That they possessed the secret gnosis. They did not write all of it, but well, because of course it had to be kept secret. 
But to the discerning eye, it was clear that the, that the gnosis had been imparted to them. <clears throat> so Isidore argued that those who became Christian Gnostics in his cultic school were not only partaking of Christianity, but also of the best of classical philosophy and of natural religion endorsed by none other than the Emperor Hadrian by joining the Eleusinian Mysteries. So Clement uh, also commented, quote, and again, in the second book of his work, referring to the second book of Isidore's work, he thus writes, And let no one think that what we say is peculiar to the elect. We said before by any philosophers, for it is not a discovery of theirs, for having appropriated it from the prophets, they attributed it to him who is wise according to them. So Socrates was actually exposed to, to a Gnostic, you know, uh, secretly. That's how he got his knowledge. That's in the Stramata, uh, book 6, chapter 6. Isidore the Gnostic was not the only one to recognize the significance of Hadrian's joining the Eleusinian Mysteries. It was so alarming that it actually triggered the creation of a new genre of Christian writing, the apology, or Christian apologetics. Now, uh, this is another problem with language, so that in contemporary English, we use the word apology to mean I'm sorry. But in its, its original usage, it did not mean that. So it's, it's actually an elision of two Greek words. The prefix apo, A-P-O, is the, the, means away from or off. And the suffix legine means to speak. So an apology, apologia, apologia, is to speak away, to speak something away. So to speak an accusation away. So it's a defense. In other words, it's a reasoned defense. It's not, I'm sorry. In fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. It's a defense. <clears throat> so uh, now we know the connection between Hadrian's joining the Eleusinian Mysteries and the development of, of this style of Christian writing, Christian ap 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 apologetics, because of St. Jerome. Now, we have been quoting St. Jerome's uh, work on illustrious men, and we will continue to do so. Uh, but the, he, he wrote many things, and, and this connection is made in another work called the Chronicon, or the, the Chronicle. Under the entry for the 226th Olympiad, which is the year 125 AD, Jerome wrote, quote, Hadrian was initiated into the Eleusinian rites and generously gave many gifts to the Athenians. Eustace is appointed as the fifth bishop of the Church of Alexandria for 11 years. Quadratus, Quadratus, the disciple of the apostles, and Aristides of Athens, our philosopher, composed books on behalf of the Christian religion to give to Hadrian. And the legate, Serenus Granius, a man most noble, sends letters to the emperor, saying that it is unjust to allow the blood of innocent men, guilty of no crime, to be shed at the clamor of the mob, and to be made guilty of a crime only because of a name and a sect. Having been so moved, Hadrian wrote to Minucius Fundanus, proconsul of Asia, that the Christians should not be condemned without evidence of a crime. An exemplar of these letters has remained until our own time. Now that means St. Jerome's time, and he, he died in the year 420, so he's late 4th, early 5th century. It is essential to understand that the apology as a form of writing was a recognized pre-Christian style of intellectual discourse, a reasoned defense of a particular position. Both Plato and Xenophon had composed apologies 
in defense of Socrates. And they were actually titled that. They, they were an apology. And Socrates was, by, the, by this period, by the patristic period, considered a hero of philosophy who suffered unjustly at the hands of a closed-minded authoritarian government. Christians argued that they were being treated just as unfairly as Socrates and equally without just cause. So, uh, in coming to terms with this, with apologetics, Christian apologetics, our first pope, St. Peter, expressed in his first letter, in the first papal letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, quote, Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for your reason, for your hope. But do so with courtesy and respect. The 19th century Anglican convert to Christianity, or to Catholicism, he was already Christian. He was, he was an, obviously, he was an Anglican, but he converted to Catholicism. He was an Anglican priest who became a Catholic priest, then a Catholic cardinal. And now it's canonized. He's, he's a saint, Saint John Henry Newman. He wrote, <clears throat> quote, There are two reasons for writing quite distinct from conversion. And considering all these things, I prefer them to any other reason. The one is to edify Catholics. Catholics are so often raw. Many do not know their religion. Many do not know the reasons for it. And there is, in a day like this, a vast deal of semi-doubting. There are those who only wish to convert and then leave the poor converts to shift for themselves as far as knowledge of their religion goes. The other end, which is so important, is what I call leveling up. If we are to convert souls savingly, they must have the due preparation of heart. And if England is to be converted, he, uh, he was English, if England is to be converted, there must be a great move of the national mind to a better sort of religious sentiment. So uh, that's a letter uh, dated January 2nd in the year 1870. He was uh, corresponding with a, a, a nun, a sister, Sister Mary Gabrielle du Boulay. B, uh, it's D-U, the particle D-U, then capital B-O-U-L-A-Y. Another Anglican priest who converted and later became a Catholic priest and an apologetics, well known as an, an apologist, was the uh, late 19th century and into the early 20th century. So his life overlapped Newman's, but he was a younger, like the younger generation. And uh, he became a priest uh, and a Monsignor, but never a cardinal or a saint. It's uh, Monsignor Ronald Arbuthnot Knox, K-N-O-X. He wrote, quote, This includes not only books, in which he presents a rationale for the Catholic faith to those who do not hold it, but also many of his conferences and sermons addressed to Catholics, in which he seeks to help them better understand the faith that they do hold. Oh, uh, I should say, uh, give you his dates. Monsignor Knox lived from 1888 until 1957. Uh, let's see, in the book, uh, and he wrote many things, uh, but the, if for those seminarians, if, if you're interested in uh, a good a, one uh, of his apologetics, it's uh, from published in 1927, titled The Belief of Catholics. Uh, moving forward in the 20th century, uh, a 20th century American, Presbyterian, who converted to Catholicism and then became a Jesuit priest, Father Avery Dulles, D-U-L-L-E-S, lived from 1918 to 2008. He wrote in his 1971 book, A History of Apologetics, 
Quote, The goals and methods of apologetics have frequently shifted. The earliest apologists were primarily concerned with obtaining civil toleration for the Christian community to prove that Christians were not malefactors deserving the death penalty. Gradually, through the early centuries, the apologies for Christianity became less defensive, assuming the counter-offensive. They aimed to win converts from other groups. Some were addressed to pagans, others to Jews. Subsequently, apologetics turned its attention to Muslims, then to atheists, agnostics, and religious indifferentists. Finally, apologists came to recognize that every Christian harbors within himself a secret infidel. At this point, apologetics became, to some extent, a dialogue between the believer and the unbeliever in the heart of the Christian himself. In speaking to his unregenerate self, the apologist assumed, quite correctly, that he would best be able to reach others similarly situated. End quote. Okay, with all that in mind, there uh, are some general characteristics of ancient Christian apologetics. So I'll just enumerate these for you. First, the ancient apologists were ardent monotheists who became the first of the church fathers to attempt an explanation of monotheism that would be intellectually persuasive to pagan intellectuals. I mean, instead of just saying, you're wrong, you know, either either your gods are just literary fantasies or they're demons. Uh, I mean, they, they would, you know, they might say that, but but um, I'll write that. But then, ex- but then explain it, not not just you know, not not just write it off, but actually give an intellectual, a reasoned explanation. Hence, the you know, it's rooting in the in the in the pre-existing philosophical genre of uh, the apologia. Second, the apologist created the liniments of Christology and Trinitarian theology out of necessity of explaining the, the, the term that Jesus used more than once, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What exactly does that mean? What, what is the relation? I mean, Jesus used it, so we, we you know, I mean, it, it, he used it more than once in, in some very important passages, so, you know, it, it, it had to be explained. Now, this had to be explained in different ways to different types of people. Clarification on what this meant, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was needed in addressing Jews, addressing Jewish converts to Christianity, addressing pagans, addressing pagan converts to Christianity, who might easily just think, okay, it's three, it's three gods, three different gods, and address pagan intellectuals who, did, who just dismissed it as self-contradictory. The juxtaposition of a monotheistic assertion with a triadic divinity. And they also had to uh, ex- offer clarification to Christian groups, to Christians, because that, those, those terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, led many Christians into heresy, as we'll see. Well, we've already seen some, like the Gnostics, but there would be others. Who, and of course, it's always the extremes. Always mistrust extremes. Either go to one extreme and say, "Okay, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different deities." Uh, at the other extreme, oh well, that that is different names, for, you know, just for one. But there's no there's no real difference, you know, between them. Or as we or as we you know see the 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 Gnostics is that God is something totally other. And the and the the and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are are not, are not they're just they're just creatures, you know you that just you know just creatures like Jesus was just a man adopted or and the Holy Spirit is just a creature, like a senior angel, you know. So all those different things that all had to be, I mean, all of those are wrong. All those interpretations are wrong, but it had to be explained not only 
what the correct interpretation of the terms Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, but why? Third, refutation of anti-Christian slanders, such as Christians were disloyal for not participating in the civic religion, Christians engaged in unnatural practices such as cannibalism, based on the misunderstanding of the Eucharist, and the accusation that Christians were arrogant for classifying, just dismissing the whole pagan majority of earth as misguided and erroneous. Like, who do these people think they are? Fourth, the apologists had to craft a comprehensible explanation of ontology and metaphysics. Ontology is the doctrine of existence, the doctrine of being. Ontos just means being. So what does it mean to be, to exist, to be? It's like I'm, I'm, I be, you know, I, I am here as opposed to not being here. I exist as opposed to not existing. So the doc, ontology, the doctrine of existence, and metaphysics, which is the, 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 the doctrine of that which exists but does not exist in a physical in the physical realm, that which is just beyond the physical. You know, we talked about this, you know, how the, the dualists always have a problem with that. Plato's attempted to recon reconcile that, that the good, the true, the beautiful, those things do exist as ideas, you know, non-physical, non-spatial, but the, but the ideas do exist. And they, so the, the, the apologist ha had, to, had to explain the doctrine of existence and the doctrine of that which is beyond the physical, but nonetheless exists, to explain the nature of good and evil while avoiding dualism. Does the dualist have an easy explanation for good and evil? There's a good God and an evil God. And the good God is in the realm of the spirit. And the, and the evil God is everything material. So they have an easy explanation for it. They had to uh, engage, explain, uh, you know, correctly explain these two categories to Stoic fatalists. Not just Stoics, but all fatalists, those who believed in fate, that we don't have free will. That we, we think we have free will, but we don't. That, that it's all predetermined. You remember we covered that as far back as Babylonian astrology. It's all predetermined. Nothing we can do is going to change it. That, of course, is, is not Christian. But there were many people who believed that, so the apologists had to explain that. And they had to deal with the various philosophical repudiations of objective truth that we discussed in the introduction and still ambient in the Hellenistic world of antiquity such as um, Epicureanism or skepticism, you know, that are, you know, that the atomism, you know, all those, that, which is essentially atheism. And fifth, the apologists had to articulate a coherent, comprehensible anthropology, which in this context means a philosophy, a doctrine, the doctrine of, of, of the human person. Uh, that had that and again they had to account and they had to explain it in such a way that would it would account for sin explain sin while still respecting the intrinsic goodness of the creator and respecting human free will within a cosmology of divine omnipotence and omniscience so the apologists would be the first to assert the revealed truth that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. Yet they still had to explain the existence of sin. So that the dualists, the Gnostics, they have an easy explanation. Well, the good God didn't do this because he's all good. It's the evil God who did it. <clears throat> and they had to explain the efficacy of the redemptive sacrifice of Christ by way of contrast with lived experience. So if they, you know, if the Christian missionaries, uh, you know, would, would 
be engaging with pagans, even those who were interested, you know, were not belligerent. And they were listening, you know, okay, the sacrifice of Christ made Christ made all things new. And, you know, then the guy might say, even when he's not trying to be sarcastic, would say, well, you know, that is the world really different? You know, if you say this, this Jesus guy was, was executed in the reign of Tiberius, well, is the world different from what went before the time of Julius Caesar and Augustus, as opposed to now? I mean, so what, what really changed? And that had, that had to account for that. Okay, so um, so who are these people? Okay, uh, we can't cover every single apologist in the course, but we'll start off with, you know, we'll, we'll lay the foundations to see. Uh, we'll cover the first ones in more detail than, we, than we'll be able to cover every single one of them. So you see the foundations that later ones built on. So for this, we turn uh, to Eusebius, the 4th century bishop of Caesarea and the Holy Land, who wrote a number of works, including the ecclesiastical history. In Book 4, Chapter 3, uh, he wrote the following, quote, After Trajan had reigned for 19 and a half years, Elias Adrianus became his successor in the empire. To him, Quadratus, addressed a discourse containing an apology for our religion because certain wicked men had attempted to trouble the Christians. The work is still in the hands of a great many of the brethren. Now he's writing in the 4th century. As also in our own, and furnishes clear proofs of the man's understanding and of his apostolic orthodoxy. He himself reveals the early date at which he lived in the following words, quote, But the works of our Savior were always present, for they were genuine. Those that were healed and those that were raised from the dead, who were seen not only when they were healed and when they were raised, but were also always present, and not merely while the Savior was on earth, but also after his death. They were alive for quite a while so that some of them lived even to our own day. Such then was Quadratus. So that Eusebius quoting Quadratus. So Eusebius is not saying they, they lived into the 4th century when he was alive, but that Quadratus had met some, or, or at least they were still alive in his day. Continuing the Eusebius quote, Aristides, uh, also a believer, earnestly devoted to our religion, left like Quadratus, an apology for the faith addressed to Hadrian. His work, too, has been preserved even to the present day by a great many persons. St. Jerome, in his Illustrious Men, uh, he also writes about the first apologist, Quadratus, I, I, I forgot if I spelled that for but it's uh, Q-U-A-D-R-A-T-U-S. Uh, he, may, he is enumerated number 19 in Jerome's list of illustrious men. Quote, Quadratus, disciple of the apostles, after Publius, bishop of Athens, had been crowned with martyrdom on account of his faith in Christ, was substituted in his place, and by his faith and industry gathered the church scattered by reason of its great fear. And when Hadrian passed the winter at Athens to witness the Eleusinian mysteries, and was initiated into almost all the sacred mysteries of Greece. Those who hated Christians took opportunity without instructions from the emperor to harass the believers. At this time, he presented to Hadrian a work composed in behalf of our religion, indispensable, full of sound argument and faith, and worthy of the apostolic teaching, in which, illustrating the antiquity of the period, he says that he had seen many who, oppressed by various ills, were healed by the Lord in Judea, as well as some who had been raised from the dead. End quote. Okay, so two guys, Quadratus and Aristides. Those two works, both because of the, the quote they're mentioned together, and they're both mentioned in the time of Hadrian, so both of them uh, are candidates for being the first the first apology. Now, uh, the 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 uh, 
The apology written by Quadratus, referred to by Quadratus, it is assumed that has not survived. But the apology written by Aristides has. However, there's another document which in content is very similar to the Apology of Aristides. And it is, it is called the Letter to Dionytus. That's D-I-O-G-N-E-T-U-S. It is certainly an apology for, you know, for, for Christians. Uh, but it does not have, it does, the text does not include the author. So in the, cate- the catechism cites it and is just referred to as the letter to Dionysus. If that the the theory one theory is that if that were that work is actually the apology written by Quadratus, but he just left his name off because if he he was bishop of Athens and Hadrian was in Athens, so he sent it to him, and if Hadrian got mad and had him tracked down, you know why make it easier, so that he would the the logic thinking is that you know he just left his name off of it, but in content that's the letter. So if that's true, then the letter to Dionysus would actually be the Apology of Quadratus and therefore would be the first apology because he's the first one mentioned by both Jerome and Eusebius in writing in 125. The second candidate, if the letter to Dionysus is not the Apology of Quadratus, then it's impossible to date the letter of Dionysus. And so by default, the honor of first Christian apology must go to the other person that they mentioned, Aristides of Athens, who did write, and, uh, and he, he's uh, number 20 in Jerome's list of illustrious men. <clears throat> but they both wrote to Hadrian, both triggered by the, his visit to the, El- he's joining the Eleusinian Mysteries in 125. So uh, because of the similarity in the arguments, and even the similarity in the use, the way they use the Bible, um, I, I'm 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 going to cover the letter to Dionysus first, as if it were, as if it is the the text of the Apology of Quadratus. Now we're not required to believe that, and the Catechism only cites it as the letter to Dionysus, or actually the Epistule ad Dionytum, uh, and it's listed under anonymous writers in the Catechism. But anyway, we're going to cover that one first, and then Aristides. So uh, it is the Epistle of Methides to Dionysus, and I'll, I'll cover what that is. And so the text does not name the author, but in chapter 11, the author describes himself at, as a Methides, which is a Greek word for student. He describes himself as a student of the apostles. In the same chapter... The writer, as well as in another chapter in the in the apology, uh, describes Jesus with the term logos, the word, the same term used by Saint John in the Gospel, the Gospel of John. So that indicates that Quadratus uh, may have had Joannine antecedents, uh, because it's you know or whoever well I should say, whoever wrote this the the Methides the it says a student of the apostles, and since he uses that Joannine term. This guy, whoever wrote this, may have been a student, a pupil of the Apostle John. As it, it could be a woman too who wrote it, you know. But whoever wrote it. As for the recipient, the text of the letter addresses Dionysus in chapter one. That word means "born of Zeus." It was one of the many, many, many honorifics given to the Emperor Hadrian by the obsequious authorities of Athens when he visited and joined the Eleusinian Mysteries. So now we'll uh, cover uh, the uh, Dionysus. We can't cover every the entirety of it, but enough. Uh, so you'll see, lay the foundations for apologetics. Uh, chapter 1, quote, Most excellent Dionysus, I can see that you were that you deeply desire to learn how Christians worship their God. You have so carefully and earnestly asked your questions about them. What is it about the God they believe in and the form of religion they observe that lets them look down upon the world and despise death? Why 
do they reject the Greek gods and the Jewish superstitions alike? What about the affection that they have for each other? And why has this new group and their practices come to life only now and not long ago? All right, skipping down, uh, chapter 2, quote, Come then, after you have freed yourself from all prejudices possessing your mind and laid aside what you have been accustomed to, contemplate, not with your eyes only, but with your understanding, the substance and the form of those whom you declare and deem to be gods. Is not one of them a stone, similar to the stone upon which we tread? Is not a second brass, in no way superior to those vessels which are constructed for our ordinary use? Is not a third made of wood, and that already rotten? Is not a fourth silver, which needs a man to watch it, lest it be stolen? Is not a fifth made of iron, soon consumed by rust? Is not a sixth earthenware, in no degree more valuable than that which is formed for the humblest purposes? Are not all of these corruptible matter? Then skipping down. Might not these, which are now worshipped by you, again be made by men vessels similar to others? Are they not all deaf? Are they not all blind? Are they not without life? Are they not destitute of feelings? Are they not incapable of motion? Are they not all prone to decay? Are they not all corruptible? These things you call gods. These you serve. These you worship. And you become altogether like them. For this reason you hate Christians, because they do not deem these to be gods. Okay, uh, comment on chapter 2. This line of reasoning is taken directly from the Bible. Seminary and Jimmy have even represented a few, uh, may have uh, recognized a few of the turns of phrase. Now, of course, that biblical reasoning would be unknown to the pagan recipient, but we can read it in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 13, verses 11 through 16, as well as in uh, the Book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 9 through 22. So I'll give you uh, briefly, uh, not all of it, but uh, I'll read some of the Isaiah quotes. You recognize, you see the the exact same reasoning. Beginning at verse 9. Those who fashion idols are all nothing. Their precious works are of no avail. They are their witnesses. They see nothing, know nothing, and so they are put to shame. The ironsmith fashions a likeness. He works it over the coals. The woodworker stretches a line and marks out a shape with the stylus. He shapes it with scraping tools. With a compass measures it off, making it the copy of a man. Human display, enthroned in a shrine. He goes out to cut down cedar, takes a home tree or an oak. He picks out for himself trees of the forest, plants a fir, and the rain makes it grow. It is used for fuel. With some of the wood, he warms himself. With some of the wood, makes a fire and bakes bread. Yet he makes a god and worships it out of what is left, turns it into an idol and adores it. Half of it he burns in the fire, On its embers he roasts meat. He eats the roast and is full. He warms himself and says, I am warm, I see the flames. The rest of it he makes into a god, an image to worship and adore. He prays to it and says, help me, you are my god. So the same line of reasoning. Now, of course, you know, if any, I'm sure you may have heard the accusation, you know, Protestants will say the same thing to us that we worship statues, but, but we don't worship statues. The statues are just there to remind us, to help us focus our thoughts. But I, I mean, in, in, if any Catholic were to believe that a particular statue is divine, then that Catholic is wrong. 
is we don't believe the statues are divine. Sacred art is just meant as a help to us, a spiritual help to us. All right, back to the text. Uh, chapter 3 addresses uh, the Jews, because, you know, even, although from the way he wrote it, was, it was obvious that some of the Romans, especially someone who was, you know, well-traveled and well-educated like Hadrian, would have understood that Christians and Jews were not the same anymore. But other Romans really would not have understood the difference, since Jesus, of course, had been a Jew, as far as they knew in his earthly, uh, in his human, his human form. So from chapter 3, quote, And next, I imagine that you are most desirous of hearing something on this point, that the Christians do not observe the same forms of divine worship as do the Jews. The Jews, then, if they abstain from the kind of service above described and deem it proper to worship one God as being Lord of all, are correct. And if they offer him worship in the way we have described, they are incorrect. But those who imagine that by means of blood and the smoke of sacrifices and burnt offerings, that they offer sacrifices acceptable to him, and that by such honors they show him respect, these, by supposing that they can give anything to him who needs nothing, appear to me in no respect to differ from those who studiously confer the same honor on things destitute of sense, and which therefore are unable to enjoy such honors. All right, there's more to it, but uh, comment on chapter 3. Here on the issue of sacrifices according to the old law, we find another example of the writer mediating a teaching from Isaiah to his pagan recipient, specifically from the book of Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. Well, 11, begin at verse 11. What do I care for the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of whole burnt rams and fat of fatlings, and the blood of calves, lambs, and goats. I find no pleasure. Trample my courts no more. Wash yourselves clean. Put away your misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Make justice your aim. Redress the wronged. Hear the orphan's plea. Defend the widow. All right, skipping down to chapter 5. Uh, now, Christians, the uh, manners of Christians. Quote, For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country, nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. But inhabiting Greece, as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. That's a temporary resident in an alien land. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as if they were foreign. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. All right, comment on chapter 5. The Catechism uses this, this section, to, uh, uh, in the, uh, dealing with the duties of citizens. The whole section is, in the Catechism is Numbers 2238 through 2243. And it makes use of the letter to Dionysus in articulating correct teaching on this matter, the relationship of the Christian to the state. And since that is an issue which will recur throughout all the courses that you have with me, and is certainly an issue very much alive today, uh, we'll take a, a moment to uh, to do the, uh, the background. 
Now, of course, all Catholic teaching is biblically based because our religion is biblically based. So uh, we'll start with the Old Testament background, dealing with human authority structures. The Old Testament acknowledges the exigency of obedience to human authorities, but warns that human authority structures are best avoided, or if that is not possible, that contact with human authority structures is best minimized. You know, with the inference being that antagonism is almost inevitable. A person of faith is better served by correct behavior, individual correct behavior, which means following the precepts of the law, the counsel of the prophets, and the writings of the, the, wisdom, liter, the wisdom sections of the Bible. Those with authority, for their part, rulers, must always remember that their authority comes with a price, the price of having to account to God for how it is used, so that they also are best served by conforming their actions according to God's law and God's wisdom. So a few specific quotes for you to, to track down. Psalm 118, verse 9, quote, Better to take refuge in the Lord than to put trust in princes. Book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verses 25 and 26, quote, The fear of man lays a snare, but he who trusts the Lord is safe. Many seek the favor of a ruler, but from the Lord a man gets justice. Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, repeats, quote, Put no trust in princes, in children of Adam, powerless to save, who, breathing his last, returns to the earth. And that day, all his scheming turns to nothing. Book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verses 1 to 3, quote, when you sit down to dine with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Book of Wisdom, chapter 6. Now, I won't read all of this, but the whole section is verses 1 through 21. It's an exhortation to rulers to govern with justice and wisdom because God will hold them to account for the use they made of their authority. Now, turning to the New Testament uh, in dealing with human authority structures, we find a much stronger articulation in the New Testament than in the Old. Uh, in, in fact, a declarative mandate to obey worldly powers and to pray for those exercising worldly power. This includes, at times, accepting situations which to modern sensibilities are repugnant, such as slavery. Yet, there is also to be found in the New Testament a principle that worldly power is to be obeyed, but within its proper sphere. And that sphere is subordinated to the will of God, if properly exercised. So a few uh, uh, Bible quotes for you to track down. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. This is the Jesus offering the famous paradigm to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. St. Paul, letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Now, I'm not going to read all of it, but, uh, quote, let every person, be subordinate to higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And then skipping down to verse 7, pay all your dues, pay taxes to whom taxes are due, pay tolls to whom tolls are due. St. Paul, first letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, quote, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings 
be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. It's actually praying for rulers. Now keep in mind, St. Paul wrote this. The rulers were, were the emperors, the Roman emperors, they're the pagans, yet he still prayed for them. And the first papal letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. The whole section is verses 13 through 25, but I'll only read two verses as an excerpt. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors as sent by the king. Skipping down to verse 18. Slaves, be subject to your masters with all reverence, not only to those who are good and equitable, but also to those who are perverse. The actual Greek word used means crooked, so I think perverse is a valid translation. Uh, but then there's the limitation that it's not, you know, the worldly authority is not absolute. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. This is after the resurrection of Christ and uh, after, uh, after the ascension and after Pentecost. And the, the apostles are still preaching about Jesus, so the Sanhedrin have him arrested, brought in. Uh, and they say, quote, We gave you strict orders to stop teaching in that name, meaning the name of Jesus. Then verse 29, But Peter and the apostles said, We must obey God rather than men. Okay, extrapolating this from the individual, from the paradigm of the individual's relationship to the authority structure, we take it to the next level in the relationship of the church to the state. So that like the community of individuals who share the same faith, dealing with a larger community of individuals who may or may not share the same faith, but are part of the same political structure. This is a problem which will recur throughout history and is still occupying attention today. So it has to be addressed. The Catechism does so in sections 2238 through 2243, in which the Church makes use of the letter to Dionysus because the situation in the patristic period bears striking resemblance to today. I mean, the technology was different, but otherwise the, the dynamics are, are very similar. Consider, few governments in the world today are officially Catholic, and even those that claim to be do not uniformly apply church teaching as a guide to policy and legislation. Many governments in the world today either overtly persecute the faithful or quarantine the faithful through legal constructs, such as separation of church and state. Christian devotion to the kingdom of God can, you know, for those who wish to look for the worst, can raise suspicion that Christians are unable to be truly loyal to a state or government which does not share their faith. And in antiquity, we've seen this was complicated by the imperial cult serving as an expression of civic patriotism. So like in our country, there have been court cases that permit burning the American flag, for instance, as a form of protest. That certainly was not the case in the Roman Empire. <laughs> you know, you, the, the, the protest, you, you, somebody trying to burn a Roman eagle in protest it would not survive long. So the Catechism, uh, in that longer section, only one one of the paragraphs, one of the sections uses the letter to Dionysus, and it, it uses, it's taken from chapter 5, which we just read, uh, the Catechism number 2240. Uh, and it actually quotes, so I won't read it, it just, it just excerpts a quote from the letter to Dionysus, chapter 5, about the Christian attitude toward earthly existence. Uh, the difference between Christians and the rest of men is neither in country nor in language, nor in, that, that part that I just read. <clears throat> okay, so I interrupted uh, chapter 5 there to insert that. Uh, so now back to chapter 5 from, quote, uh, Christians marry, as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. 
They are in the flesh, but they do not consume flesh. They pass their days on earth, but are citizens of heaven. Uh, all right, because it goes on like that. So, uh, so this is a second comment on chapter 5. The catechism, in another paragraph, uh, catechism number 2271, makes use of this part of chapter 5 of the letter to Deonatus as another example providing evidence that abortion and infanticide had not only been present in Christian antiquity, but that the church had rejected it from the beginning based on the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. And that, so that's where that, you know, the Christians beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. Uh, Okay, uh, back to the letter. Let's see, we'll skip that. Skip chapter 6. Uh, chapter 7. For as I said, this was no mere earthly invention which was delivered to them, meaning Christians, nor is it a mere human system of opinion, but truly God himself, who is almighty, the creator of all things, and invisible. He sent from heaven and placed among men him who is the truth and the holy and the incomprehensible word, the Logos, and has firmly established him in their hearts. So that's why, you know, it's using that Joanine term, and he's going to use it again. So that suggests the possibility that he had been a, a pupil, a disciple of the Apostle John. Back to the quote, Do you not see them exposed to wild beasts, that they may be persuaded to deny the Lord? And yet they overcome. Do you not see that the more of them are punished, the greater becomes the number of the rest? This does not seem to be the work of man. This is the power of God. All right, that was chapter 7. Uh, see, chapter 8, he's uh, addressing the Zoroastrians, the Stoics, uh, Thales, the philosophers. See, I'll skip that. Uh, chapter 11, he uses uh, the term Logos again in discussing Jesus. I'll skip that. Uh, okay. So you, anyway, you get the picture, the, the argument. So the uh, the next apology we'll cover, which is either the first or the second for reasons already discussed, uh, was authored by a Greek philosopher who converted to Christianity. Uh, and this is Aristides, Marcianos Aristides or Aristides of Athens, Saint, Saint Aristides of Athens. That's spelled A-R-I-S-T-I-D-E-S. -E His feast day is August 31st. His apology consists of 17 chapters. And uh, he is number 20 in Jerome's list of illustrious men. Who, who wrote of him, quote, Aristides, a most eloquent Athenian philosopher and a disciple of Christ, while yet retaining his philosopher's garb, presented a work to Hadrian at the same time that Quadratus presented his. The work contained a systematic statement of our doctrine, that is, an apology for the Christians, which is still extant and is regarded by uh, uh, philosophers uh, as a monument to his genius, end quote. Okay, so a quote, uh, we'll be, just go through the text again, not all of it, but some excerpts. All-powerful Caesar, Titus, Adrianus, Antoninus, venerable and merciful, from Marcianus Aristides, an Athenian philosopher. I, O king, by the grace of God, came into this world, and when I had considered the heavens and the earth and the sea, and had surveyed the sun and the rest of creation, I marveled at the beauty of the world. And I perceived that the world and all that is therein are moved by the power of another. And I understood that he who moves them is God, who is hidden in them and veiled by them. And it is manifest that that which causes motion is more powerful than that which is moved. But that I should make search concerning this same mover of all, and as to which is his nature, and that I should argue as to the constancy of his governance, so as to grasp it fully, 
That is a vain effort for me, for it is not possible that a man should fully comprehend it. I say, however, concerning this mover of the world, that he is God, God of all, who made all things for the sake of mankind. And it seems to me that this is reasonable, that one should fear God and should not oppress man. I say then that God is not born, not made, an ever-abiding nature without beginning, without end, immortal, perfect, and incomprehensible. Uh, then he goes on and on like that. So I'll insert a comment here. Uh, here we see Aristides introducing Hadrian to the biblical concept of wisdom, even using some of the same terms, the same imagery, the same approach, as found in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 7, beginning at verse 15, quote, Now God grant I speak suitably and value these endowments at their worth, for he is the God of wisdom and the director of the wise. For both we and our words are in his hand, as well as all prudence and knowledge of crafts. The beginning and the end and the midpoint of times, the changes in the sun's course and the variation of the seasons, cycles of years, positions of stars, natures of living things, tempers of beasts, powers of the winds and thoughts of human beings, uses of plants and virtues of roots. Whatever is hidden or plain, I learned. For wisdom, the artisan of all, taught me. For in her is a spirit, intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, agile, clear, unstained, certain, never harmful, loving the good, keen, unhampered, beneficent, kindly, firm, secure, tranquil, all-powerful, all-seeing, and pervading all spirits, though they be intelligent, pure, and very subtle. For wisdom is mobile beyond all motion, and she penetrates and pervades all things by reason of her purity. See the motion? That's the same thing that he, he referred to in there. For she is a breath of the might of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore nothing defiled can enter into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. Uh, okay, you get the point. Um, okay, so now back to the letter, chapter 2. Uh, let us now come to the race of men, that we may know which of them participate in the truth of which we have spoken. This is clear, O king, that there are four classes of men in the world. Barbarians and Greeks, Jews and Christians. The barbarians, indeed, trace their origin, the origin of their kind of religion, from Kronos and from Rhea and their other gods. The Greeks, however, from Hellenos, who is said to be sprung from Zeus. And by Hellenos there were born Aeolus and Zeuthus. And there were others descended from Aeacos and Phorenus, and lastly from the Egyptian Dinos, and from Cadmos, and from Dionysius. Now he, he got, anyway, I know, uh, the Jews again trace their origin of, the, of their race from Abraham. The Christians then trace the beginning of their religion from Jesus, and he is named the Son of God Most High. And it is said that God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin assumed and clothed himself with flesh, and the Son of God lived in a daughter of man. This is taught in the gospel, and it is called, which a short time ago was preached among them. And you also, if you will read therein, may perceive the power which belongs to it. This Jesus then, who was born of the race of the Hebrews, he had twelve disciples, in order that the purpose of his incarnation might in time be accomplished. But he himself was pierced by the Jews, and he died and was buried. Now, now notice here, he said, it was actually the Romans that killed Jesus. Now there was a conspiracy among the Jews, of course, but uh, Aristides is, is just kind of leaving out that little detail, oh, it was the Jews. And he died and was buried. Uh, and then after three days he rose, ascended into heaven. Uh, okay, I'll skip uh, uh, chapter 3. The barbarians then, 
as they did not apprehend God, went astray among the elements and began to worship things created instead of their creator. And for this end they made images and shut them up in shrines. Great then is the error into which the barbarians wandered in worshiping lifeless images, which can do nothing to help them. And I am led to wonder, O king, at their philosophers, how that how even they went astray, and have the name of gods to images, which were made in honor of the elements, and that their sages did not perceive that the elements are also dissoluble and perishable. Chapter 4. Let us turn then to the elements in themselves, that we may make clear in regard to them that they are not gods. Those then who believe concerning the earth that it is a god have hitherto deceived themselves. At times the earth becomes unfruitful, for if it be burnt to ashes, it becomes devoid of life, for nothing germinates from an earthen jar. Chapter 5. In the same way again, those err who believe the water to be God. For the waters were created for the use of man and are put under his rule in many ways. They suffer change and emit impurity, are destroyed and lose their nature when they are boiled. In like manner, those uh, also they who believe that fire is a god, erred in no slight extent, for it too was created for the service of men and is subject to them in many ways, the preparation of meat and as the means of casting metal and for other ends whereof your majesty is aware. Again, they also erred who believe the motion of the winds to be a god, for it is well known to us that those winds are under the dominion of another. At times their motion increases, at other times it fails, and ceases at the command of him who controls them. So also, chapter 6, So also they erred who believe that the sun is a god, for we see that it is moved by the compulsion of another, It revolves and makes its journey. It proceeds from sign to sign, rising and setting every day, so as to give warmth for the growth of plants and trees, and to bring forth into the air, where with its sunlight is mingled every growing thing which is upon the earth. Chapter 7. And those who believe that the men of the past, some of them were gods, they too were much mistaken. They have a beginning and an end. They were born, they died. Chapter 8. Let us turn further to the Greeks, that we may know what opinion they hold as to the true gods. The Greeks, then, because they are more subtle than the barbarians, have gone further astray than the barbarians, inasmuch as they have induced, introduced many fictitious gods, and have set up some of them as males and some as females, and in that some of their gods were found who were adulterers and did murder and were deluded and envious and wrathful and passionate and parasites and thieves and robbers. And some of them, they say, were crippled and limped, and some were sorcerers, and some actually went mad. Some were given to roaming on the hills. Some even died. Some were struck dead by lightning. Some were made servants even to men. Some escaped by flight. Some were kidnapped by men. Some indeed were lamented and deplored by men. And anyway, you get, he goes on and on like this, just making fun of the mess. But, uh, but notice <clears throat> one difference from the previous guys we covered who all, as far back as St. Paul, you know, just, just assume that the, that the pagan gods, of course, they were not gods, but regarded them as demons masquerading as gods, whereas he just says this is all made up. Aristides said that it is fictitious, that this is, this is all just completely made up. Uh, okay, then chapters 9 through 14 recount the stories of individual gods, Zeus and all those, uh, and demonstrating that summation of above. So, uh, and hence mankind have received incitements to commit adultery and fornication, to steal and to practice all that is offensive and hateful and abhorrent. For if they who are called their gods practiced all these things, which are written above, how much more should men practice them? Men who believe that their gods themselves practice them. All right, so you see the point. Uh, Okay, chapter 15. But of the Christians, no, Christians, no one trust in God, the creator of heaven and earth, in whom and from whom are all things, to whom there is no other God as companion. 
from whom they receive commandments, which they engraved upon their mind, and observe in hope and expectation of the world which is to come. Wherefore they do not commit adultery, nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother, and show kindness to those near them. And whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the image of men, And whatsoever they would not that others should do unto them, they do not do to others. And of the food which is consecrated to idols, they do not eat, for they are pure. And he goes on about that, like that, about the, uh, uh, they do not worship strange gods. Uh, They care for the poor, for for the widow. All right, and the 16... Uh, okay, all right, that, you get, anyway, you get the picture. Uh, so, uh, comment on chapter 16. The Catechism makes reference to this um, in uh, number 760, part of a larger section on the origin, foundation, and mission of the church. So, the Catechism number 760 refers to the uh, Apology of Aristides, chapter 16, line 6. So, I'll just read the Catechism, quote, Christians of the first century said, The world was created for the sake of the church. God created the world for the sake of communion with his divine life, a communion brought about by the convocation of men in Christ. And this convocation is the church. The church is the goal of all things. And God permitted such painful upheavals as the angels fall and man's sin only as occasions and means for displaying all the power of his arm and the whole measure of the love he wanted to give the world. Just as God's will is creation and is called the world, so his intention is the salvation of man, and it is called the church. Okay. Um, All right, so that's, there's a lot more I skip, but I think it's enough to, you get the, See the you know the way he argued not only what the arguments were but the way he presented them. The final event from the reign of Pope Telesphorus that must be covered is the sad fate of Jerusalem, which was erased uh, from the maps and stayed erased from the maps for centuries. The trigger for that unhappy outcome can be traced to the year 130 A.D. The Emperor Hadrian visited Jerusalem as part of the same tour of the provinces that had brought him to Athens. Wherever, of course, he built, you know, the, the, everywhere he went, he started building things. He, he, Villas, aqueducts, gymnasiums, ports, forums, roads. I <clears throat> uh, saw himself as a new Augustus bringing beauty to the empire. His, <clears throat> his building compulsion was triggered when he saw much of Jerusalem still in ruins after Titus had suppressed the first Jewish revolt in 70 AD and after Titus had suppressed the Quito's revolt, you know, much more recently when Hadrian was governor of Syria. So here is how a Roman historian, Lucius Cassius Dio, uh, explained it. And this is from book uh, 69 of his work, uh, the, the, uh, the Roman history, chapters 12 through 14. Uh, that summarizes that this is the revolt of Simon Bar Kokhba. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want you to see how, how it was understood in the time. So beginning with chapter 12, line one, quote, at Jerusalem, he, meaning Hadrian, founded a city in place of the one which had been raised to the ground, naming it Ilia Capitolina. Now I'll interrupt there. So uh, Ilia, A-E-L-I-A, that refers to his gens, his family. Uh, Elias Adrianus, so that was his family. Capitolina, caput his head, so refers to Zeus, or Jupiter of the Romans, which is the head, the head of the gods. So it was the city of the Ilian gens, gifted by the Ilian gens in honor of Zeus as head of the gods. All right, back to the quote. And on the site of the temple of God, he raised a new temple to Jupiter. So you remember the, uh, Titus tore down the Jewish temple, but the but there was still a flat space there, and on the Temple Mount, Hadrian 
started to build a temple to Jupiter. So you know what's going to happen. Cassius Dio expresses it this way, quote, This brought on a war of no slight importance nor a brief duration. For the Jews deemed it intolerable that foreign races should settle in their city and foreign religious rites planted there. So long, indeed, as Hadrian was close by in Egypt and again in Syria, they remained quiet, save in so far as they purposely made of poor quality such material as they were called upon to furnish, in order that the Romans might reject them, and that they themselves might have use of them. But when he went farther away, they openly revolted. To be sure, they did not dare try conclusions with the Romans in the open field, but they occupied the advantageous positions in the country and strengthened them with mines and walls in order that they might have places of refuge whenever they should be hard-pressed and might meet together unobserved, underground. And they pierced these subterranean passages from above at intervals to let in air and light. At first the Romans took no account of them. Soon, however, all Judea had been stirred up, and the Jews everywhere were showing signs of disturbance, were gathering together, were giving evidence of great hostility to the Romans, partly by secret, partly by overt acts. Many outside nations, too, were joining them through eagerness for gain, and the whole earth, one might almost say, was being stirred up over the matter. Then, indeed, Hadrian sent against them his best generals. First of these was Sextus Julius Severus, with six legions, who was dispatched from Britain, where he was governor, dispatched against the Jews. Severus did not venture to attack his opponents in the open at any one point in view of their numbers and their uh, desperation, but by intercepting small groups, thanks to the numbers of his soldiers and his under-officers, and by depriving them of food and shutting them up, he was able, rather slowly to be sure, but with comparatively little danger, to crush, exhaust, and exterminate them. Very few of them, in fact, survived. Fifty of their most important outposts and 985 of their most famous villages were razed to the ground. 580,000 men were slain in the various raids and battles. And the number of those that perished by famine, disease, and fire was past finding out. Thus, nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate, a result of which the people had had forewarning before the war. For the tomb of Solomon, which the Jews regard as an object of veneration, fell to pieces of itself and collapsed, and many wolves and hyenas rushed howling into their city. Many Romans, moreover, perished in this war. Therefore Hadrian, in writing to the Senate, did not employ the opening phrase commonly affected by the emperors, If you and our children are in health, it is well. I and the legions are in health. Uh, Eusebius uh, added from the Christian perspective in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 6, Sections 1 through 4, on the revolt of Simon Bar Kokhba. Quote, the rebellion of the Jews once more progressed in character and extent, and Rufus, the governor of Judea, when military aid had been sent him by the emperor, moved out against them treating their madness without mercy. He destroyed in heaps thousands of men, women, and children, and under the law of war, (laughs) law of war, enslaved their land. The Jews were at the time led by a certain Bar Kokhbus, which means star, a man who was murderous and abandoned, but relied on his name as if dealing with slaves, and claimed to be a luminary come from heaven, was magically enlightening those who were in misery. The war reached its height in the 18th year of Hadrian in Betar, which was a strong citadel not far from Jerusalem. The siege lasted a long time before the rebels were driven to final destruction by famine and thirst, and the instigator of their madness paid the penalty he deserved. Hadrian then commanded that by a legal decree and ordinance, the whole nation should be absolutely prevented from entering from from thenceforth even the district around Jerusalem, so that it could not even see from a distance its ancestral home. Ariston of Pella tells the following story. Thus, when the city came to be bereft of the nation of the Jews, 
and its ancient inhabitants had completely perished. It was colonized by foreigners, and the Roman city, which afterwards rose, changed its name, and in honor of the reigning emperor, Elias Adrianus, was called Elia. Okay, evidently, Hadrian's plan was to build an entirely new city on this ancient site. He laid out his design and then moved on to Egypt. Once the local Jews saw construction workers on the former Temple Mount in 132 AD, they asked, what are y'all building? They said, oh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a temple to Zeus. Then uh, a local, Eusebius calls him a bandit, named, uh, actually his, his name was Simeon Bar Kosova. Uh, but because of the similarity in the names, it was Simon Bar Kokhba, because Kokhba means star. So, son of a star. He proclaimed himself Messiah. Gathered around himself a group of, of young zealots who, who were waiting for a Messiah like King David, like King David freed the Holy Land from the Philistines. So, they wanted a Messiah to free them from the Romans. Uh, in 132, they ambushed and massacred the 22nd Legion which was sent from Arabia Petra, just as the zealots 64 years earlier had done, and in doing so invited yet another gruesome reprisal. Bar Kokhba declared the, declared the Holy Land free, no longer part of the Roman Empire, with himself as the Nasi Israel, the Prince of Israel. Three years, the war lasted. By 135, the revolt was crushed so thoroughly that Jews played no role in the history of Jerusalem again until the 20th century. Nearly half a million Jews, actually over half, based on Cassius Dio, over half a million Jews were killed in the Holy Land, along with many others who just got in the way. Afterwards, Hadrian pursued his revenge like a, like a vendetta, a cultural revenge, that, as if you know, killing over half a million wasn't enough. Circumcision was outlawed in the Holy Land. Jews were forbidden to even approach the city, let alone enter it. Hadrian prohibited application of the Torah, the Torah law, and the Hebrew language uh, in, in the Holy Land. And any scholars that he found who tried to live in hiding in the Holy Land just because they wanted to live there, if they were captured, they were executed. Any sacred scrolls, uh, of, of the Torah or the uh, uh, the Nebiim, the, the prophets and the Ketabim, the writings, any of that that was, was just burned, anything the Romans captured. Uh, and uh, the temple to, 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 to Zeus, to Ilia Capitolina, was, was put up on the Temple Mount in which he installed two statues, one of Jupiter and another of, you guessed it, himself. And then in an attempt to just erase the whole memory, he, he on the imperial maps, he just changed Israel, Judea, that was Jerusalem, it was just taken off the maps. So uh, instead, the province became Syria, Palestina. Hadrian completed his temple to Zeus on the site of the old Jewish temple. And uh, then he went out of his way to profane uh, sites sacred to Christians and Jews, clearly, you know, not caring enough about the, or not even appreciating the difference between them. He placed a statue of a marble hog on top of the city gate, which faced Bethlehem. On the place where Jesus was crucified, Hadrian placed a statue to Venus. And in the place where Jesus rose from the dead, he had put another statue of Jupiter. In the grotto in Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, he installed a shrine to Adonis. Now, ironically, after Christianity was legalized and St. Helena made her pilgrimage to the Holy Land, these desecrations, these intentional desecrations, meant that she was able to find the sacred sites because those, those, des- those shrines were still there. So she just had to remove them and dig them up and, and find the relics that she later found. Uh, Pope Telesphorus was captured and martyred during Hadrian's reprisals after the Jewish War. He was followed as Pope number nine by Saint Hyginus. We'll cover next in the next session. Uh, his remains were uh, the method of his martyrdom has not been preserved, uh, but his remains were uh, interred 
on the in the graveyard on the Vatican that we talked about near those of uh, Peter. So he died on January 2nd, 136. The Libra Pontificalis tells us that he, he continued to perpetuate the apostolic succession. He held four ordinations in the month of December, but we aren't told the years, ordaining 12 priests, eight deacons, and 13 bishops. So next time we'll pick up with Pope uh, Hygienus. Uh, so for the, uh, for the moment, uh, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned. <laughs>